Good morning, Lionhearts. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? Okay, <laughs> excellent. I'm doing great too. First off, thank you all for watching all of these vlogs that I've put together for December. I haven't done daily vlogs for quite a while, and it was nice to see so many people were back to watching them every day. Now, once the beginning of the new year starts, I'm going to cut back to probably two, three vlogs, maybe a week. But thank you all for tuning in this December and making this some of the most watched videos I've ever done. Now let's head out and have a great day. Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. Would you two like to kick off the day? Well, good morning, Ja. How's life treating you? Do you mind if we go out and do another Hollywood Stars Homes of Beverly Hills tour today? Okay, well, we're gonna do it anyway. <laughs> well, we've made it over to Beverly Hills. As you can see over here on the wall, it says, have a lovely holiday, Beverly Hills, and then down here, happy holidays. However, they literally locked down the entire park, the entire fountain with the Beverly Hills sign and everything I was going to start this at. They have locked everything down in Beverly Hills. All the statues you can see are covered. You can't get to them. <laughs> It's a, it's a wacky world we're living in. Look at that. That's that rabbit I filmed many times. Completely got it fenced in. And across the street, you can see the same thing with all the art over there. Sign says, no assemblage in BG Park. All right, today's tour is of North Rexford. So I guess we'll start right here at the Hawthorne School, this elementary school was once famous for having alumni Jack Abramoff and Monica Lewinsky. There's a really nice landscape of the school here. I really like that dome. Take a look at that. Kind of weird that we stopped at a elementary school in Beverly Hills and the only two alumni I could find affiliated with it were famous for being and kind of involved in scandals. Here's our first house of the day. This belonged to the wonderful screwball comedian Carol Lombard. Now she got a very, very early start. She was started as an actress in silent film because she was raised in Fort Wayne until she was 12 and her family, her mother's parents were pretty wealthy so her and her mother came out here alone and started to have a life in Los Angeles at the age of 12. Uh, Carol got uh, pretty much immediately put into pictures and even had a contract by the age of 16 except her contract ended up running out right before her 18th birthday because um, and they didn't renew it because she had been involved in a car accident where her face had hit the windshield and she had had to have some surgery. So she did end up getting picked up by another studio. And like I said, she had made silent pictures for people like Max Sennett, who was actually maybe number one or two of the great comedy producer directors at the time. But Carol had a great career. It's actually my favorite movie of all time, My Man Godfrey. But I think the one that really garnered her a lot of attention was 20th Century with John Barrymore. It is hilarious if you've never seen it. So Carol lived here from 1929 until 1931 when she would move not too far away into a house with William Powell because even though he was much older than her, she had fallen in love with William Powell and they went and got married. It didn't last very long, but when she moved out of here, her mother stayed living here pretty much until she died. And of course, Carol, after she divorced William Powell, she actually was in love with also Russ Columbo, the singer who had a very weird death that I vlogged once before. He was, a friend was showing him like an antique gun and the gun went off, the bullet ricocheted around the room and killed him. So Carol did not have the greatest luck with men until she fell in love with Clark Gable, even though as many know, he was already married at the time, but didn't stop him. He was in love with Carol, and they would sneak off together to 
many different hideaways because the paparazzi were always kind of stalking them and he got a divorce and they fell in love and she was so funny like as a person they said that the reason that he loved her so much was because she would cuss and she was kind of like one of the gang and in fact as like a gift um she had sent a bunch of doves to his hotel room <laughs> so they uh they had a great relationship until unfortunately she was um prematurely killed in a plane crash she had been off selling war bonds and uh was rushing home didn't want to wait for her train so her and her mother and her agent were flying home to uh to come see clark and the plane crashed into the side of a mountain and that pretty much a lot of books and everything say that was like the death of clark even though he lived on for years after that he immediately like joined the military and tried to sign up for every flight suicide mission that there was and um and really never got over her death carol her mother and clark gable are all buried at forest lawn cemetery in the mausoleum the great mausoleum together so our next celebrity home is coming up right up here and the uh person who lived there lived there during the 1930s it was boris karloff man famous for frankenstein's monster and um playing i'm hotep and the mummy he played frankenstein's monster quite a bit actually this was a short time residence for him not the famous one that most people know he had one where he had a famous rose garden that I believe Catherine Hepburn lived in as well at one time, but uh, wow, look at that statue right there. Yeah, Boris Karloff did tons and tons of movies. He was even a railroad worker and um, was a character actor, played just about every nationality of a character you could play until he finally took off in the Universal Monsters movies. But he did a couple of those as Frankenstein's monster, but the costume and the makeup were just too much he had 11 pound boots and this really intense makeup that took hours and hours to do so he just didn't want to do it any longer kind of cool to see one of his homes now we're going up to the 800 block now the next house that we're gonna see was by a famous actor who lived to be over 100 years old and has a very famous son who is also an actor. We're gonna see Kirk Douglas's house. So for many years, this was Kirk Douglas's house with his wife, and this guy is one of the most famous actors of all time. One of the biggest box office draws of the 50s. Heavy, heavy hitter in the drama field known for Spartacus, portraying Vincent Van Gogh in Lust for Life. That's where I really, really became kind of interested in his work. To see him do that portrayal was pretty amazing. And then of course, like I mentioned, his son is Michael Douglas, who's been in everything. And um, actually they have an interesting story together where Kirk Douglas starred in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest on Broadway and then ended up purchasing the um the rights to it and gave it to his son michael douglas who turned it into a movie almost surprising that michael didn't decide to star in it himself huh but he's also credited as um helping to destroy the hollywood blacklist because he was the one that insisted dalton trumbo write for spartacus and get screen credit so he had um produced movies pretty much up until his death, which was very recent. And his best friend was a friend of mine, Noel Blank. And Noel told me that they were involved in 1991 in a helicopter crash. An airplane actually hit them and um, they were both lucky to survive. Kirk had this property for quite a while. Really fantastic career. Like I said, he was, he was, um, known for westerns and war movies and he had a very um, manly explosive acting style guy could really bring the drama 
And you can kind of tell from this other entrance where the driveway is that the property is pretty deep. There's guest houses and everything that go into the back. Now this next property is really great because in Palm Springs, the last time I was doing a Celebrity Homes tour of Palm Springs, we saw his Palm Springs house. This is Don Adams' mansion. Look at that fountain. It's not on, but Don Adams was Inspector Gadget, Agent 86, Get Smart. He was uh, Tennessee Tuxedo. It's interesting, he got his start doing comedy. He was on uh, the Steve Allen show and was uh, then on his friend Bill Dana's show portraying a detective and had a contract. So what ended up happening was um, they did a pilot for Get Smart. Mel Brooks and Buck Henry actually had written that for Tom Poston and that was for ABC. But when ABC ended up passing on wanting to do the show, NBC picked it up and already had Don Adams under contract and Don Adams was really funny anyway so he was like a perfect person to portray Maxwell Smart because Maxwell Smart was basically like a spy spoof and so Don Adams created this um, speaking style where he basically mimicked William Powell from the Kennel Murder Case and the Thin Man movies. But he became a very wealthy man from doing these. He ended up actually writing and directing some of the episodes. Pretty cool, Don Adams house. And I believe Don Adams was also a major landholder in California as well with some of the money that he accrued from the production of those shows. So this mansion that they're renovating right now was once the longtime home of Edward G. Robinson, one of the Heavy dramatic actors of his day played a lot of kind of like crime roles What they literally called the heavy made a lot of movies did a lot of television Stage plays really a true actor And I was kind of surprised to learn for one thing that he was gray listed because he was an early on vocal opponent of Nazi and fascist beliefs, so he was actually in the very first American movie that warned people of Nazism. And then he was eventually ended up gray listed, so he didn't get a work for quite a bit, but eventually made his way back into television. And one of the things that shocked me the most was to find out that he was offered the part in Planet of the Apes of Dr. Zayas, and actually did screen tests with Charlton Heston, who was one of his best friends, and ended up turning the movie down because he was having um, heart problems and said that he thought that the long hours um, and wearing the makeup and the costume and everything, he just thought that that would be too much for him. So he didn't end up doing the role. But his last performance ever was with Charlton Heston in a scene for Soylent Green. You can tell this is a very beautiful house. You can see some of the balcony and everything. So once they get it finished, I'm sure it'll look wonderful. Edward G. Robinson tried to enlist in the military when World War II broke out, but he was 48 years old and they declined him. Now right next door to Edward G. Robinson's house is Jeanette McDonald's house. And Jeanette, we showed one of her other homes before, she was one of the major singer musical stars of her day. They called her one of the most influential Sopranos of the 20th century. She did a ton of stuff with Marie Chevalier and Nelson Eddy. But what I was kind of surprised to learn about her was that she suffered from debilitating stage fright. She had to go to therapists and the therapist had to teach her to imagine audiences as lettuce. And um, this plagued her for the rest of her life. They said she always worried about everything that she did. In fact, she, um, she would stress out so much. Doctors told her not to even have children because she would always have fainting spells, dizzy spells. She would get so anxiety ridden that she would quit eating. So that was, you know, they said she could have had a bigger career had she not had all the health problems. 
because even in 1929, that young, or that early on in her career, she had had a heart attack. But she has this nice, beautiful corner lot here at one point. I love it. So this little home right here, this little Hacienda type home, was once home to one of the biggest stars of all time, Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney started in vaudeville, went into silent film, was a child star actor, did many musicals, was Andy Hardy, then enlisted in the military, served two years in the military, and had a 90 year career. Can you believe that? Guy worked pretty much all the way up till the end. It's kind of sad though at the end, um, a friend of mine was able to go talk to uh, some of Andy's relatives and it sounded like he really was kind of taken advantage of later on in life, the end of his life. But man, what a career he had. They said when he was with MGM, the years in the 40s that he was making most of his main starring films because once he went to the military and came back, he couldn't do like the kid movies anymore, the juvenile pictures. He actually was one of the most reliable box office draws that they had. They knew if they put Andy in something that it was going to be successful. This house has kind of been let go a little bit, but I was also surprised, or maybe not surprised, but uh, I just didn't know his first wife was Eva Gardner. So the last house on our tour today is Clifton Webb. Actor Clifton Webb, who I really haven't went into too much detail about on my channel ever, other than telling in the William Frawley vlog about how supposedly William Frawley worked with Clifton Webb in a play and they did not see the eye to eye. And William Frawley thought that Clifton Webb was talking disrespectfully to him and said if he kept doing it, he was going to punch him. And then he apparently did and got fired from the play. This house. <laughs> What a story. Okay, so apparently when Clifton Webb lived here, even then he believed that it was haunted. I just noticed it's for sale. So when Clifton's mother died, he believed that she was haunting the house then too. And then when the house was sold, the new occupants said that they believed Clifton was now haunting the house. So this house is supposedly haunted by three different ghosts. Now what's crazy is that um, Clifton Webb was also said to have, or maybe still does, haunt his final resting place at Forest Lawn. And um, people say that when they're there that the room gets cold, they hear noises, they hear talking, they can smell his cologne. And, um, and then psychic Kenny Kingston was friends with Clifton and had a chair that Clifton used to own and said that he had like a little barrier around it, like ropes around it, and that oftentimes that chair would move. And that if anyone sat in it, like a guest or particularly a woman, the woman would be ejected from the chair. So who knows if Clifton Webb's ghost is here, where Kenny Kingston's chair is, wherever that is now, or at his final resting place. But it's a beautiful mansion, look at that. If you're a ghost hunter, maybe this is the place for you. And that was definitely his address, but some conflicting things online say that this is a newer house that was built afterward, but it makes you wonder if his spirit still would live on that same property or come visit that same property as it did. I've never actually seen a Clifton Webb movie to my knowledge, but I did read that he was the original Mr. Belvedere. So he made three Mr. Belvedere movies and I did like the TV show, so I'd be willing to give this a chance. As long as he doesn't haunt me afterward. Look at that tree, doesn't that look like a face in there? Is it just me or do I see an eyeball right there, an eyeball right there, a crooked nose here, and kind of like a beard? Oh, Beverly Hills. What tricks do you have up your sleeve that I won't figure out? All right, my friends, we're going to call it a day. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this little exploration of Rexford Drive in Beverly Hills. 
We'll see you all next time. Have a great night and goodbye.